You go, Mayor. Our, our internet's still down there. We're piggybacking off of my mobile hotspot for this, but hopefully James will get it up and running here in a few. Get it? I'm still on cellular. Oh, yeah, get started without it? Yeah, we got the Zoom working, um, but the city internet's still down, but hopefully they'll get it popped up here. Okay, let's really get started then. Okay. One more time. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> right. Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, work session. Today is Monday, January the 9th, 2023. Time is now 3 p.m. 3 old 8 p.m. Uh, work session will not come to order by Zoom as well as in person. Uh, the work session tonight entails we have a few items. Item one, no mark update. Item two, landfill tipping fees. Item three, June, uh, Juneteenth discussion. Item four, plastic bank fees. And item five, liquor license fees. Let's go ahead and get started with Noah's ARC update. And I guess we have people from North West here to give us a presentation. Who's going to present? Yeah. Mayor, if the town is not working, I can just share the screen for the various items so that you have the supporting documents. Yeah, you probably have to do that. Nothing's coming up. Thank you, Audra. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Laura Fidella. I'm the President of Noah's Ark Animal uh, Welfare Association. I would like to go ahead and introduce the other board members. Uh, we have Candace Welch, who is our Vice President. We have uh, Deb Hodel, who is our Secretary. Karen Griego is our Treasurer. Deb Anderson is our Board Member. And our Executive Director is Matt Lewis. Um, Noah's Ark has been uh, operating the animal shelter as a contractor for the city of Trinidad for more than uh, 26 years. During that time, there have been a lot of changes, but the biggest change came about in 2022 when the new shelter was open. Um, as this was the first year that we had uh, a full year of operating in the new shelter, we want to update you with some details. We sincerely appreciate the partnership that we have had with the city in uh, operating the shelter, both for the community as well as for the animals in our community. What I would like to do is uh, turn it over to Matt Lewis and he'll present the details for you. Matt? Before, he, before he comes up, sure. uh, anybody whether, that's you're using it to get on the computer, turn off your cell phones, please. Okay? Appreciate it. Hey, Matt. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah. I uh, look forward to uh, making this presentation day. What I'm trying to do, I, I started on August 1, and frankly, it's been a learning experience. Um, many different areas. I thought I came in um, with a great wealth of experience behind me, and, and I'm realizing I'm not going to always learn more. Uh, so what I thought, what I have had recently an opportunity to do is to go back and just look at numbers. My background is about numbers, and so being able to look at what's been going on in the past and then try to re relate to what's going on today, I, it's, for me, it's been helpful. And if it's all right, could I approach and pass along some sure. info? <clears throat> so what we have here, first page is the numbers, second page. Second page is a, a graphic representation if I could, I apologize. I only made seven, but I think you've seen this possibly already, Karen, so maybe we can pass along one over here so that you don't have a reference. And I can definitely copy everybody with these two. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So everything really revolves around uh, animals coming in providing uh, care for those animals, and then obviously trying to move those animals out, whether it be through adoption, through transfers, 
Uh, we, what we don't want to do is have animals that are just being kenneled there all the time. Um, this particular year, I came in in August, and i got to say it's been a very uh, uh, dynamic and interesting period since I've been in. Uh, and what I find from looking at these numbers is, in fact, this year was an exceptional year. If we go back to 2014, and that's uh, the earliest numbers we, we were established back at the beginning of the century, but those are the earliest numbers that I actually showed in my data. Our first column shows that we had 1,757 intakes. At the end of the year, we had 710 outcomes. The difference is going to generally going to be reflected by uh, either a, a, an animal uh, death for someone, for whatever reasons there's, and we can always look into the details as to why. Um, in that year, we had 91 euthanasias that represented 5% five and five percent, just over 5% of all the intakes. We fortunately had a good number of uh, adoptions, a significant number of uh, transfers, and then return to owners. We'll see this pattern continues the first two years. 2014, we see an increase. To, uh, excuse me, if we come back to the first section, what I'm looking at is year-over-year -year change. So the difference between 2014 and 15, we had a 10% 10, 10 increase, 10.87% increase in, in intakes between 14 and 15. Um, 15 to 16, 12%. And then from 16 forward, we've had consistent reductions in intakes. And we see that it happens fairly dramatically somewhere around 2017 to 18. And I'll get into some details about that right there. The other things that I find myself looking for are, well, one, let me adjust this for a second here. Um, if we come over here to transfers, you'll see that a significant portion, anywhere from uh, 30 to, uh, what do we got here, 30, 40 percent of our animals are being transferred. For me as a director, that becomes a question mark because anytime we bring an animal in, we assume liability immediately. Does that make sense, mm -hmm. Mayor? Yeah. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So whenever we bring an animal in, we assume liability immediately, both cost liability and then medical care as far as you know quality of life issues. Yeah. Um, and so when I see that, and I see that it's occurring significantly with non, it's not interstate transfers that are occurring. Most of these transfers are occurring from out of state coming in, it presents the question to me in, in my role as the director, why would we accept the, the cost and the potential liabilities when there's not a revenue source? We're not a for-profit organization, so there's got to be a balancing. And frankly, I haven't been able to dig deep enough into our historical financials to get that answer yet. What I've looked at so far is that we do not have an in, income source related to transfers. Now, I've done a little research in-state, and basically there are no shelters that are interested in paying us to transfer animals to them. Most shelters in-state are in the same condition as we are. Well, many of them are overcapacitated, and they need to move animals out, so they're not going to pay for animals to come in. My second question is, is we, we do... We did during this period have a significant number of transfers that came in from out of state. And so I'm trying to do a little research with these organizations to find out if maybe in the past they were paying us revenues. I'm not seeing that in our chart, in our uh, financials, so I don't know what that answer is yet. Um, as I look here at 2018, as I come down from here, we see that we have a significant reduction annually of trans, excuse me, of intakes, uh, but, and I'm not quite sure how deep to go on this yet, but what I like seeing here is that we saw also about the same time period uh, a consistent increase in adoptions and return to owners. So just from the outside, from the surface level, I'm wondering if because we're not transferring as much, are we spending more time now I, I know my experience since I've been here is that we spend a significant amount of time and effort to get our animals to be adopted and to get them to return to order. I'm not suggesting that wasn't the case before. They had significantly more inputs, but with the animals we're seeing here now, 
as you can see, our uh, adoption rates have, have gone up 20% plus. Um, and of course, that's a lot of data here. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll make a comment on, I, I didn't go into a great detail here, but when we look at euthanasias, that's always a concern. One of my big concerns was that when we were doing significant transfers, how many of those animals were actually getting put down for whatever reasons. The, the fact of the matter is, is that um, the numbers seem to stay consistent. We saw a period here at the 2018-19 uh, when we saw a significant drop. When we look at euthanasias, they're classified two ways. Either health euthanasias, where uh, the, the, the owner, for whatever reason, wanted this animal to be put down, or uh, unhealthy. So this animal is going through chronic health conditions, they're in pain, or they're a danger to society. And fortunately, what we're seeing in the euthanasias is that proportion, the ones that are unhealthy and a risk to society, is definitely a higher proportion than, than uh, the healthy ones, which is good positive information. At this point, any questions regarding, I know it's a lot of information, but I wanted to give you something so we had a, a, a picture of where we were before and where we are now. Well, that's a pretty good uh, a bit of information for us to look at. Okay. And it, it, it kind of gives us an idea of where you've been and you know, where you are today. I was going to ask you, Matt, what do you do during non-operational hours when somebody comes by and drops off a cat or a dog or a litter? Right. Uh, how do you handle that? Hopefully, and fortunately, I've had that occur multiple times while we're there. I have yet to have that occur when we came in and there was a box of kids. What we've had is people that have pulled up, uh, you know, we're there at 8, 7.38. We don't open up for the public till 10.30 or 11. And so they'll pull up at 9, they'll drop them and hat out. And we try to, uh, there's not a whole lot we can do. We go, I mean, the animals are there at that point. And yeah, trying person. to chase the person on down, we're not physically going to get in the car and chase them on. Yeah, surveillance cameras. There? Well, very well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we don't have them up at now. That's one of our budget issues right now. Um, we, it is a. Uh, many folks are not aware that it is. Anytime you abandon an animal, it is an animal control. It is a a misdemeanor. Uh, there is. A, implications of animal cruelty there. The same thing applies to when we uh, feed uh, feral animals, feral cats. As soon as we do that, we assume that responsibility for that animal. Practic practically, I've got to say that while that's a burden, I'd rather put the person drive and drop it off at our doorstep than to leave it down by the river or, or somewhere else. I mean, unfortunately, those things are going to happen. And what we try to do is to just address them as we can. We do have a policy, though, that we're not accepting, especially right now. We're, we're going through a process where we're having to thin down, and we're not accepting feral animals at this point, and we're limiting what we're accepting from out of the city limits until we can get a better grasp of things. I think you bring up a good question. Oh, I'll wait. Uh, any other questions for me? Are you going to keep going down the... In, in taking outcome analysis? I'd be happy to. I just am curious how we're at 603 this year, and we, uh, eight years ago we were at 1757. Correct, like correct. So what we find is that right there about 2017-18, 2017, we have a 33% drop, 15% drop, and consistent from there. Um, and I'm going to preface this. I don't, you know, I don't have the history here. I wasn't around, so I don't know exactly what happens. What I'm doing is going through old board meetings and, and trying to gather things. What I do know is that we had a change of uh, management. My position had changed somewhere in that period, and I believe there may be a, a, a philosophical change between the old director and the, and the director at that point. And everything. Okay. Um, and that, that bears up, as I've been communicating with other shelters around the state, I've had that comment a few times that we used to have a, a much more active relationship with you. We don't know what happened, but things are changed. Um, you know, I'm all about developing relationships across the state and across other states. The, um, 
the challenge that we're facing now since COVID has been that we are just overwhelmed in terms of the number of hours. During COVID, we saw a spike in adoptions nationwide. And so in many cases, we didn't have the animals available for adoption. And then since COVID, people going back to work, people during COVID that probably should have had an animal, they didn't get them spayed and neutered. And, and so now we're just seeing this nationwide flood of animals out there. Other questions from the council? You know, I do have a question, and then this would help you possibly. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking at the first item on, you know, on our drive here, uh, the number of cats and dogs that have been taken in uh, as of uh, the last year. And Trinidad was 56.68% of dogs, and we will use the dog side first, and 29.57% from Los Angeles County. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me grab that real quick just so I'm on the same page. And, you know, what that tells me is almost half of the animals that you receive in is from the county. You know, and I understand, you know, the letter that you, you gave us about not accepting anything outside of the city. The thing about it is my, pers my feeling is that the county has some responsibility. And I think that that would behoove you guys to go to the county because they just, last year, and they just, um, in their budget, allowed $120,000 for nonprofits. So they should kind of, I think, so, pitch in on this. May I? Sure. I'm sorry. I'm going to take my council hat off and put my <laughs> Noah's Ark hat on. So what happened is, to give you a little timeline, um, when the new shelter was built, it was right, you know, about 2020, 2021. Um, we had to cut down the size of the shelter because of the, the price of material and labor. Even if we were to go to the county now and ask for money, we don't have the capacity to take care of the animals. That shelter is only built specifically for the needs of the city of Toronto. So the county is going to have to go on their own and find a solution. We've had a few. Uh, we had uh, Canyon City was recognized as one of the top shelters consistently over the years. I think they were this top shelter in Colorado. <laughs> Excuse me, 2019. I think. In any case, as we've been going through some of these challenges, we asked. Uh, their leadership to come in and basically do an audit of what we're doing, tell us what we can do better. You know, we're all open to good ideas. One of the first things that they shared, uh, and this was a, an eye opener for me, is that what we have is what's considered a boutique shelter. This would be fine for uh, if we had toy pools or if we were a very, uh, you know, a very uh, limited in what we do and everything. Uh, physically, one of the things that he pointed out is size-wise, we probably need at least double the square footage to, to handle the volume between the city and the, and the county. And then, uh, uh, and then the features of it that were uh, done. Um, and frankly, I, I know the board shares uh, my thoughts here, is that uh, it, it's frankly wasted time to try to figure out why this happened this way, what happened, what, what we have is what we have, and we need to, our philosophy is we need to adjust to it. So one of the adjustments was the suggestion that we go from a open shelter where we accept any animals, I mean, not just from Allen County, we, as an open shelter, we were accepting animals from New Mexico that were being dropped, any place. So we have to get to where we have a limited budget, we have to focus on where we have a contractual obligation responsibility with the city, and, and that's where it is. I would like to think that as time goes by, we're, we're, we're coming out. Back about two, three weeks ago, we were at a maximum capacity level. We've been able to reduce that. Uh, I've got to say, working with the, the Animal Control Department here in the city has just been outstanding. They really do a great job of communicating with us, working with us, um, um, just uh, Officer Smith and Officer Gonzales have been just outstanding to work with. Um, 
And another thing that I'll also say is, uh, I won't say who, but somebody has shared that they appreciate the fact that we don't have as many animals being put down as there used to be in the past. So as a, a, a little uh, side comment, that was an interesting comment from somebody that's day-to-day -day working all this stuff. Yes, sir. Let me ask you a question. Well, well back, <coughs> I reckon you said, can we uh, add, aren't we going to add, uh, we had talked about adding some more spaces for dogs at the center? Um, Mr. Mayor, members of the, the council, so uh, what we're actively working on right now is uh, tearing down that cooling tower that's in the back of the, uh, if you guys have seen that, it's, a, it's an old cooling yeah. tower that used to be part of the power plant. Um, and it's a fire hazard, first of all, but we're starting there. We have some bids in to go ahead and tear that down. And then, you know, our plan is to give at least some more outdoor space to the animal shelter. Right now, we don't have really plans to add additional kennel space. So I know we had talked about that, adding on to that. If I, I mean, this might be a good time. Yeah. Um, the, I want, and I'm no rush to change anything here. I can answer as many questions here, but to your point, I also have, what I thought might be uh, some suggestions that, that would apply to what you're saying there also. Thank you. Okay about that, sir. And Mr. Mayor, Matt and I have had uh, many conversations and we're, we're, we're keeping in touch with the dialogue on what we're going to do to address the lack of space. Um, being quite candid, the best thing that for the community would be to build a second shelter. Uh, I mean, it's, it's that high of a demand. But uh, Matt can probably speak more to what space you would need and how we could add that to the additional shelter. Um, but certainly, anything we can do to give them more space just for their general operations, we want to be partners in that. One thing, and before I go into the suggestions, I shouldn't have handed it out because everybody owes a reason before. <laughs> but, but one thing I'd like to, it, it bears uh, having a discussion about is are folks familiar with? the different philosophies between behind shelters and kennels, uh, what's called a, a no-kill philosophy versus a social conscious philosophy. Okay, explain. <laughs> Basically, uh, both of them follow very similar, I mean, it's, it's almost a nuanced difference. Both of them uh, dictate that we do not kill an animal unless it is um, in pain, or, or chronically is never going to be able to have a better quality of life, or unless it's a uh, threat to humans or other animals. We, we would both follow that philosophy. As I've been able to discover the nuances, is that with socially conscious, there's also a concept that, look, you can't put an animal in this kennel for X amount of time, you know, for more than 90 days or whatever amount, and say that that animals having a good quality of life. And so socially conscious will at some point, and I have not been able to find out that it's 30, 60, 90 days, but at some point they say for, at this point we cannot get this animal adopted for, it has multiple uh, deals of cancer or whatever it is. We can't find an adoption, so we're going to do the humane thing when we put the animal down. Our experience has been is that there's really not any time. The pain issue, the quality of life issue is critical, but we've had the animals, we had a, a beautiful uh, um, Rottweiler. It was a big, loud dog, about two years old. We had him for probably about four months. Nobody wanted him, and then the rancher that was looking for a Rottweiler because his was gone. So these stories are constant. I mean, literally, any week we will have a dog that is considered to be here too long and literally we have a new forever homeowner that's crying as they're adopting that animal because it's such a deal. So until I'm directed by my board or the city that we're going to make a major philosophical change, I'm going to sort of follow those parameters. The reason I highlight that is one of the things that I feel that I could be doing in my role um, more effectively and that I look to do, especially out of these numbers, is to try to reestablish some of these transfer relationships. Uh, as long as I'm re establishing them with, with, with a no-kill shelter, what I really am not interested in establishing a relationship where we take an animal that has good health but it has a couple of years on them and moving them someplace where suddenly that animal is going to be in a 30-day or 60-day window. Uh, I say that philosophically. You know, I'll, I'll respond to whatever the directions are and everything. But I do believe 
that from what I'm finding in our database now, that there's going to be the opportunity. I don't know why the previous uh, director eliminated many of these relationships, but I'm looking forward to hopefully establishing some of these relationships again. The point there is being is that you know we have a uh, a limited um, what do you call it? a limited um, adoption pool here. You know it's quite possible that we have that same animal around Colorado Springs or Denver where you got millions or hundreds of thousands that we can have it adopted more effectively up there. So I'm definitely open to doing that, and if we can do that, that will help in terms of moving animals. My concern still as the director is. When we bring in an animal, we assume liability, both, both uh, uh, not criminally, but uh, with PACFA, state regulations, and we assume financial liability. So I'm more interested in, in serving our community, hopefully more of the folks from our surrounding communities, and if that to transfer out. I'm not, I, I don't see a real benefit of taking in animals from other states at this point. <clears throat> I think the state of Colorado is just flooded as it is, so I have a hard time understanding why we need to take animals. And I'm open to learning. You know, there may be a, a good reason why. Uh, for me right now, it just seems like a, a, a big financial loss to us. I do have a concern here, uh, and I know that uh, in parting ways with the, the bringing in animals from the county. Mm -hmm. You may have somebody in the county that may come in with an animal, they come and they are not aware of this situation, yeah, yeah. and they then you tell them, well, "I'm sorry, we can't take this animal." Right. So they do. They go down the street and turn the dog loose mm -hmm. or the cat loose. Right, right, right. Then we have our animal control that picks up this dog yeah. or two or three or whatever, right. yeah. and they bring them to you. Right. What are you going to do? Yeah. So first of all, when we have, you know, we're not. It's not a cold turkey thing. When a person comes on in, I respect the fact from the beginning that person's made effort to come to us. That person didn't just come into the town and just drop the animal. So I'm always trying to work with an individual. We get different personalities. One of the things that we try uh, to talk an individual into is that we're, and the side thing is, is that we're redeveloping or rebuilding our uh, website. And so one of the things that we would ask is, hey, could you give us two, three days, foster the animal, we'll start uh, promoting it on our website. We'll do everything. We'll give you food to feed them. We'll do everything we can because we don't want that animal coming in at this point. If it becomes a point where I have a serious question that that person's or they threaten that they're going to do that, I, I really, this is one of the things I don't have my staff do it. I get involved with this because it really becomes a point is, is it our best interest to explain to the person what their liabilities, legal liabilities, or is it the best interest to go ahead and deal with the animal? Ultimately, we're dealing with animals' lives, and there's a balance point. I'm trying to keep our, you know, what I'm trying to do at this point is to get our capacity level down to about 70%. We're running consistently at 95% and above. I want to get us to somewhere around 70 80% where we have more opportunity for both animal control as well as these off-the-wall deals. Um, there's more possibility of what I just mentioned with cats. Oh. Because they're easily put in a box and Lock yeah. them off at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. There you are. But anyway, these are things that I think that. Uh, are very good. And right. if I could, I'm just gonna. I apologize. I got off, and I realize I'm I'm running time wise. One of the things in doing this process that I realized was that I don't know if we're unique as a nonprofit uh, um, um, What's the word? We're a contractor. As a nonprofit contractor. In our role versus, say, the golf course or whatnot, I know that as a nonprofit, we're putting our monies back on in. But one of the things I find unique is not only are the monies coming in from donations and grants, but everybody involved, and I know in senior manager, our board, whatnot, are, are putting in a lot of their own personal investments into the organization through different ways. And as we go through here, one thing I realize is that. This first section, number one, what we're talking about are things that the city is obligated to do that has contracted us to do on behalf of the city. When these contracts were established years ago, and, the, and whatever the uh, uh, thought process was at that time, we weren't in the, the 
uh, volume that condition that we are now. Uh, I, I know that as an organization, we wouldn't have uh, negotiated the contract is now simply looking at what the cost of living is, inflation, all the, the lesson learned about how, I, how many animals were coming on in. So I just highlight here that we're really a partner. We're not here so much, at least in my mind, we're not here to ask so much as to see if we can't maximize our relationship so that we're doing the services that we should for the city property and that we're all aware of what, in fact, it costs to operate an animal shelter. If, if we were out of the picture right now, that thought process would have to go through. So as we're going, go ahead and tie up some ends on this because we have quite an agenda. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and, and I'll let you read it to your, to your extent. What I'm highlighting in the first page is simply some of the realities that we've become aware of. And on the second page, some suggestions about what we could possibly do with the city going forward. The one thing that I'd really like to get across here is the number five. I mean, there's a bunch of good information. But right now, when we go out to do a, a project, you know, whether it be putting up shade for the animals or whatnot, we're going out to the marketplace, and some folks are giving us a discount rate, but we're basically paying retail whatever the person wants to do. I don't know if there are some services that by working with the city, we could jointly reduce what the cost is so that it you know, would be beneficial both to the city and ourselves. Ultimately, whatever we're doing to the shelter to improve it is, is going to be the city's property. So, Mr. Ruber, the, the one item on there that I was looking at, and I'm not sure what you're doing is, but item number four, yeah. allow the shelter and our city personnel for grant writing, and we have a grant writer. We do. And would she be able to help, or is she over capacity right now? What she does? No, that's something that Matt and I have already talked about, and I think that would be a terrific uh, resource to offer, you know, as time permits, certainly. Sure. But if uh, our grant writer has some capacity to help assist in these, we would absolutely love that out. Sure. See, uh, Steve, we're going to have all of the personnel that were there, the prior EDs with all the grant money. So we, didn't, we don't even know really where to start, how to give to the people that are. So maybe uh, Aletha can help us with that. Yeah, I think uh, it might be a good idea for us to schedule a meeting with Talitha and Matt and kind of brainstorm on how we can identify sources and, and work with you all. Absolutely. Any other questions? I appreciate your time. I apologize if I uh, over too, too much time. I know there's a lot, you know, that you... And I'm more than happy to come back at any time, too. Because I know there's a lot that you probably can give us, and we appreciate what you've been able to give us today. It's very informative, so thank you for that. Quick question, Matt. Does the ASPCA routinely monitor animal shelter? No. They don't themselves. They're a great resource that I go to a lot. It's it's really uh, path that that's. Mon I'm sorry. When you say monitoring, or they we we send in numbers reports wise, but they 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 don't come out and not regulate regulate us. Like that. Right. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you more for coming to the appreciate Thank you. Thank you for your time. We got an item two and then to fill our fifty fees. Right. I have uh, some comparisons I'm gonna pass out for you all. Thanks, sir. You're so welcome. So um, I'm going to start on the uh, the comparisons, uh, which is what I just handed out to you. So it's it's some, in some cases apples and oranges uh, the way landfill fees are assessed. But what I wanted to kind of just look at was for our residents, if they're going to go drop off uh, trash at the landfill, what's it costing them now, and what do other communities charge? So just to kind of um, put things into perspective, right now our our landfill fees are twenty seven dollars per ton with a minimum of $10. So most folks who are going to our landfill are paying just the $10. Um, it'd be rare that someone would come in a private vehicle that would have a ton of trash. But even still, if you look at the national average for ton, um, it's 54.03 in 2021. Um, in our region, the Mountain Plains, it's 47.83. Um, just wanted to kind of pull a few from around Colorado and certainly 
the economies are different there, so we take these for what they are. Um, but like looking at Denver, for example, they just flat out charge $127 per car. Um, or 157 to 213 per pickup, depending on how full it is. Um, Montezuma County, the second one that's on the list there, is probably one of the most comparable to us. And right now, their, their tonnage is 53.91, and they're just slightly higher um, on their minimum fee of 11.93. Uh, looking at Larimer County, they charge a minimum of $24. Um, Pitkin County, $15. Uh, Summit County, obviously, a very expensive county to live in, but $20 per car, $35 per truck, $72 per ton. Um, then there's some, like Glenwood Springs and Werfano, who charge uh, for bags. So for 30-gallon bag, if you bring that, and Werfano is $3, Glenwood Springs is $4. So it's kind of kind of all over the map. So we are going to, we have some proposed rates that, that Bob's put together. Um, which will have an impact, and we, we want to, to look at those and fine-tune those and get you even more comparisons um, as we go through this process. But we just kind of wanted to kick off in a work session before you know, we bring an amending ordinance out of the blue. So this is just a little bit of background information. But Cheryl's here, and she can help me uh, talk about this. Our, our big concern with the landfill, we updated our fees in 2020. And quite frankly, um, as they compare to everybody else, uh, just looking at overall comparisons, what uh, I, I have a report that says what we collect in uh, landfill fees for cubic yard compared to the rest of the state, and it's about three dollars consistently for across the board. So we're really not out of whack with our fees, and increasing them would put us maybe slightly higher than some other communities. The big concern that I have, and uh, Cheryl can fill me in, uh, can correct anything I say wrong. But um, the structure that we have right now with the landfill being an enterprise fund, it's just not set up to be sustainable. Um, so basically, all the revenue we collect in at the landfill, which I believe Cheryl's about half a million a year, um, that, that's the only money we really have to fund all the operations for the landfill. And just to give you an example, we have a request for a $150,000 piece of equipment coming in a special meeting after this one. If you look at our, our, our financial statements, um, our net position ending um, last year, or through December 20, 2021, so end of 2021, put us at a $633,370 deficit. So we're, we're just not generating the revenue that we need to operate that as its own standalone fund. And again, you know, raising the rates, I would definitely support raising our per ton rate and definitely support our tipping fee maybe going up a little bit. $15 is not unreasonable. But in terms of the amount of revenue that we're going to generate, let's say we doubled all our rates. We're talking about a million dollars per year. Yes, that would have a huge impact, and that might get us to where we need to be. But doubling all our rates is unreasonable. That would put us way out of scope for everybody uh, compared to everybody else. So really just wanted to kick off the conversation. I think we have a structural issue right now. Now, our policies permit us to transfer up to 10% um, into uh, the fund for marijuana, which helps a little bit, but just think about all the things that have to happen out there. We have a lot of very expensive equipment. We have personnel. There's no way we would ever be able to add personnel out there as it stands today. Um, as far as issuing debt or taking out a loan, there's really, we have no capacity. There's, there's no lender on the planet that would loan us money to operate the landfill. Uh, so other entities that are successfully operating their landfill, for the most part, they're not enterprise funds. They're just a uh, department out of the general fund. So we would collect a certain amount of revenue from the landfill that's appropriate. And you all, uh, with the budgeting process, would just budget that and make sure the landfill is, is sustainable. And that allows access to quarterly marijuana and uh, other funding resources that we might have. So really, that's kind of where I wanted to start the conversation. We, Bob, I support Bob's proposal. It puts us at a very high um, tipping fee, but it's not not higher than everyone. And uh, there are some comparisons that support a $20 um, tipping fee per resident. Um, but I, I really feel that ongoing, we're still, we have $633,000 to make up for in a deficit right now. Um, I just don't see how we're going to be able to sustain the operations out there. I mean, I guess the biggest, I guess the biggest concern there is, you know, of course, we would have to go back to the voters. It is yeah. a concern. 
and yeah. uh, we'd have to go through the general fund an additional six hundred thousand dollars, and how it's going to impact yeah. the general fund. Yeah. And Cheryl, would you mind maybe kind of commenting on on some of that? Um, the last thing I'll say is, is the truck purchase. We're actually how much would a new truck cost, Bob? Five hundred. Yeah. So a new truck would cost about <coughs> half a million. We were lucky to find one used with a considerable amount of miles, but in good shape. Um, for 150,000, so we're we're not even buying a new truck for the landfill. It's, it's that to that oh, level. Truck. Right. So a, a dump truck. Oh, oh. The yeah. most significant reason for the deficit is the closure and the post closure costs. So the liability is 2.1 million dollars, and when it was sitting within the general fund, it was tucked in with the general fund's fund balance, which is extremely healthy, and so it didn't ever show negative as a deficit. Now the likelihood of us ever having to close the, the landfill within the next 20 years is slim, but should it ever come upon us, the general fund's going to have to pay for that anyway, somehow, some way, because the landfill can't pay for the closure funds. And then I don't know what we would do with the fact that we can only um, contribute 10% from other funds from the general fund. So, I mean, into the land fund. So I would imagine we would have a material or significant weakness or material weakness or significant finding in the audit because the enterprise can't stand on its own. So in the end, our own policies, I believe uh, as council the one who set the policy that each enterprise fund can only be granted 10% from another fund. I don't know if we would have to change that policy in order to cover that closure cost. But you know, like I said before, in general, it was tucked in there. It was hidden within our um, general fund fund balance and it was just covered. I, I know that I'm not saying it correctly, I can see it in my mind, but um, that's kind of the gist of it. The general fund is healthy enough to cover that liability. Now, the fund balance, though, consists of assets as well as cash, correct? Not the general fund. Not the general The general fund is cash. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's why I asked them all yeah. back in the, to get us. Even a, if, you know. The fund balance is only what assets mm -hmm. compared to the actual cash. No, the general fund is a governmental fund, so. Yeah, it'd be good to have that. When, um, okay. when it was voted to become an enterprise fund, if there was actual dollars earmarked for the closure, <coughs> would it have been possible for those to transfer? We transferred what we had. We had some sitting in um, an investment fund. I believe it was only about 900000 mm -hmm. So that's taken into account here. The money okay. was transferred from general into land. That is okay. But it, it just, it's never been enough to cover the liability. And the six hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars deficit does include landfill assets, which they're not. You know, we're talking about all this, but you know, we need to really take into consideration by raising all these fees. People are going to start dumping stuff everywhere. I mean, they're already doing it. I mean, I, I can give you some really good examples of where people are just dumping trash. So we really need to kind of figure out some way we can work this out uh, on the fees because, I, I mean, we need it for the dumps, I agree with you, but, you know, it's, it's really tough because we're going to end up picking up trash for nothing yeah. because people are just going to keep dumping it everywhere. Well, they do anyway, but, you know. But it'll get worse. It'll get you. worse. But, you know, what my concern is, and I'm glad we're researching this, but... <clears throat> What always bothers me is when we first started, I first started on council, I think it was 23 years of the life of the landfill. But you factor in now, we've had two major hailstorms that is in, has lessened <coughs> that life. Plus, we're getting a lot of construction going on in Trinidad. So I'm thinking that 20-year life is probably less than that now. So I think it's it's imperative that we increase those um, fees to to help increase the the money on hand we have for. It. So but don't we have what, property that that we can expand on the dump now because we bought all that land back there. What's the Bob? Do you know the current um, life expectancy of the landfill is at twenty thirty five? I understand your concern. Uh, yeah. But we probably have at least 40 year life. Okay. We took a, a great shot out there. We, we have over 15 feet of fill in 
and that's a very big area. Okay. So we can expand in lots of directions. That area we bought that's been right. very uh, beneficial for borrow material. Uh, we can't place fill out there, but we're using it to yeah. for cover. So. Right. So I think just uh, the immediate concern is what I said earlier. Yeah. If we wanted to add staff, or if we have another piece of equipment that we need, we just. I, I don't know how we would pay for it. So we were on the right track with marijuana when um, council was backfilling the compensated absences, paying off debt. We just waited a little bit longer. We might have been able to start chipping away at the landfill um, liability. But then it turned into an enterprise fund, and now we're limited, only throwing in 10% from marijuana to cover landfill. So if we would have waited even just a bit longer, we might have been able to cover that deficit. I mean, for liability. So I guess that's one of the questions then, maybe for Cheryl and Les, is it worth looking at changing our policy and could we do that specifically for just the landfill? And I don't know where that policy stems from. I don't yeah. know if it's a budget issue. We, I would have to research that. I don't know if 10% is recommended of the statute. I don't know where that 10% came from. I don't want to look into it also. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Give, us, give us a couple of options here. That's what I'm thinking. So Mayor, and council not to belabor this that's kind of the highlights for today what i would suggest is give us a little bit more time to uh, research the policy issue do a little bit more comparisons and come back with you to you all at a work session with a couple of options before we we do anything to change the fees i have a question i have one more question if i may yeah um i i don't think that we would have an answer for this i don't think but um you know we have the electric rate increase which supported and I think was necessary and gas, gas rate increase which I supported and I think was necessary. Do we know um, what uh, the local trash companies um, rates will increase by when this happens? I mean because of you know that's gonna hit every constituent and some some people have concerns about fixed income then so now they've you know I mean, it's, it's going to be the third thing. It's something that I think we should consider. It's a very good point, Councillor. Absolutely. I mean, I think we can bank on the haulers um, passing our increased fees along to their customers, without mm -hmm. doubt. And uh, I don't know what that would look like, but they're going to probably factor that into their profit margin. I just got a message uh, from Rightway from right that they are increasing fees. Already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Twenty five yeah. but. I, which I didn't think was um, that significant, but they went from 72 to 75 a quarter. I think ours went to 92, 72 to 92. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, wow. Like it's significant. Yeah. It's right. Does that sound right? Residential. I'm pretty sure it's in the middle. I just read last time, but I don't remember if it came What about uh, commercial um, use? What about? Do they get a break or do they get a... Uh, I believe the commercial rates are a little bit lower than the residential rates um, because of the amount of usage. Is that correct, Bob? No. Oh, no. Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, well currently, <clears throat> currently they are. They are $5 less, but yeah, they would be the same as residential. In the new rate structure? In the new rate structure. Okay. So currently they are. New rate structure proposes them making the same. But let's hold off on okay. the discussion on the new rate structure until, but uh, really just wanted to take this opportunity to talk to you about what's going on in the fund and some, some bigger concerns uh, than just raising our rates. Well, this gives us some you know, time to get some food for thought. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Sure, do I recall your strong opposition to the landfill becoming an enterprise? And I see you recall that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Just. Where to go down that number one? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, item number three, Juneteenth, June, Juneteenth discussion. Yeah. What are we doing? With this? <laughs> okay. Mayor Council, so, and, I, and Dawn is here too, so she can certainly assist. She's ran some financials on this. So, in negotiations with ASME this year, um, they requested, uh, we were only get able, to, as you know, to get to a 3% pay raise, which is a little bit lower than we have been. So, they've requested, um, in lieu of uh, additional percentages to for us to consider Juneteenth as a holiday um, for the city. Now, that would affect all unions and, and all the employees here. It would have to be a holiday that we would offer to, to all employee classifications. 
And so it's really just a policy decision. I kind of wanted to, you know, get your thoughts on on that adding the paid holiday. But before we do that, I'd like Donna maybe to speak about the financial implications um, and and where we stand on our paid holidays at this point. Good afternoon. Um, so you know that right now, currently, we have 12 holidays a year and 13 on general election years because um, we still get um, election day off. So this would make it 13 and 14 um, if we add this day. Um, if we rough calculations for um, increases to the um, to wages would be about twenty thousand dollars for that's police, fire, um, power plant. A couple, there's a couple guys in water. Um, those twenty four those twenty four hour operations that have to get paid holiday pay. It's another holiday for them. So it's around twenty thousand dollars to add another holiday. That's just for the pay. Um, that doesn't. And then you have to figure that lost production on the day that all the other employees are just not working. So. Um, Anyway, and then I believe that um, city manager forwarded you the information about the other communities. Yes. That looking at the so. right. Question to the yeah. council. You don't have a question? No. Um, I see on the list that you sent, Steve, that we're on the not planning to observe, but that's not accurate, correct? That was when this list was created. Okay. Yeah. So. There, there could be a few people on this list that have gone one way or the other, but um, this was a list that CNL compiled um, when it was when everybody was going through the great decision of whether they were going to add it or not. Okay, I you know I think it's a nationally recognized holiday now. Mm -hmm. I would I I have no problem with observing it, but I would like it to be a floating holiday. That way, the impact on the city's workforce. It's a little bit less than it if everybody took the same day off. Yeah. And we, we discussed it. We did. There's other people that have cultural events in their life that maybe instead of Juneteenth do St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. If you're really in love with your partner, Valentine's Day. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard if you're in love with your partner. We're <laughs> probably going for um, Groundhog Day. <laughs> it's definitely not Valentine's Day. But I think, you know, when you stop and see what we what we gave for wages, if that is a concession that they want, I think it would be more than appropriate to do it. But I really like the floating. Yeah, and uh, the floating holiday would be a use it or lose it. So if you don't take it in that calendar year, you know you wouldn't you can't build it up for the next year or anything like that. Um, one of the concerns. That, that it could create, but it's, it's a general concern anyway, is we have a lot of employees who have worked here for a long time who are getting up to their threshold on vacation and having a, a challenging time even taking the vacation that they have allotted. Um, so I, we probably, if we, if we went forward with it as a fluid holiday, we would want to put some parameters in to say you know, how it can be used. You know, whether it's um, you have to have used your excess vacation before you can use that, or the opposite, you use that before but we want to kind of look into that as well. Okay. Other questions? I think what um, Councilman Lincoln suggested is a good way to handle it. Other questions? Um, I mean, I have a question. In, in um, negotiating with the um, unions, mm -hmm. it, is that something that we've already conceded to then, or? No. No. This because is something we committed to having a discussion with you all on and get your feedback. I mean, uh, my thought is we're starting to already approach um, passing what a typical employer would be for holidays, and I, I don't know offhand, but I mean, if you use the argument of the absurd, let's say we continue increasing holidays <laughs> until, you know, we have you know 24 paid holidays, and I, I know we're not going to reach that, but it seems to me we have to, at some point, in, in order so that the budget remains intact and the ability for the city to respond 
to work um, remains intact, I think you have to start maintaining um, workable man hours through the year. In my opinion, if we're going to do it, I think we should use the approach of doing it in lieu of um, one of the other less significant holidays, New Year. Um, that's that's my opinion because otherwise you really start to increase the city's um, ability to um, respond as you know as we're supposed to, and that's 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 the reason we're here to support uh, the city's needs and um, make be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. That's my opinion. Well, just to add on to that, um, I would say. On a year, if we were to add this on the general election year, we're going to have 14 days off on just holidays, and we're going to have four personal days. So that's 18 days. So you're looking at three and a half weeks that someone can be off just on holidays. Mm -hmm. And then if someone takes three weeks of vacation, there's a lot of people that have that time on books, then you're looking at six to seven weeks a year off just on that. So that does not include sick time. So, to Councilman Williamson's point, I mean, it is starting to impact productivity. So, just to dovetail on that, if we did, speaking of the election day off, if we did want to sub it, that would be a good candidate. Um, uh, federal law already allows um, employees to have up to two hours to vote on election day. So, um, that is that is one that that we would suggest and identify as one. So you only get Juneteenth off every other year. <laughs> that's, right. yeah. that's true. No, yeah, that's Why true. couldn't we do that on the, on the years that we have general election day off? Just make it every other year. Yeah. We yeah, that's a good suggestion. And then that, then it would be a net zero in terms of holidays. So here's the other thing that I was thinking about is um, you have except there was a loss of about an additional loss of. $20,000 revenue plus the workable or the production productivity. Um, and the reason why this has come up, it sounds like, is because of the what we were able to do as far as wage increases. Okay. Now, we don't know at this point in time if there's going to be a wage increase for the employees come July. So my personal feeling is, is we not do anything now until July to find out. But the thing about it is this is going to come up again. It will. Whether it's this year or next year. It'll keep coming up. Yes, it's sir. going to keep coming up. Yeah. So all it's doing is tacking on additional time for vacation time that employees can take. And I think it starts creeping into the productivity like has already been addressed. And that, that, that is a concern. We have, there's a cap that we've got to reach. We have to understand and that's a cap that I think that the Unions need to understand as well that there's only for so much time that we can allow for vacations and time off or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is a well, we're really at a tipping point here. So what, what do we do with the time a lot about? And that certainly is a suggestion. We can uh, we have committed to reviewing uh, the increases uh, in salaries for this year at mid year to see if there's any drastic change in our financial forecasts and uh, have that conversation. So we definitely could wait you know, until mid-year to have a conversation on this as well. I can't remember, what was the thought of, let's say at mid-year, let's say there was some additional revenue. What was, what was your thought about it and how much to increase their their wage? Is it an additional 3%? Well, it, it just depends on the union. Um, so for example, for police, we're taking this fiscal cycle to really try to make um, some dents in equity and getting base salaries up to where they need to be. For the other unions, fire and, and ask me, we're looking at straight percentages across the board. So it might be different amongst the unions, what that would look like, Mayor, but all of it would be predicated on whatever the increased revenue is and our comfort level on its sustainability. I, I, and where I'm going with this is, uh, let's say we allow this Juneteenth to go forward. I think you take that average cost to the unions and let's say we were going to give them a three percent raise in july 1st or whatever that would be yeah take that into account and back this off of that <coughs> percentage raise i think that would be more than fair yes. i think that would be something that you'd have to consider yeah. but i still am 
the, the mutant with the original capacity of Cap. I don't, in the United States, and I'll admit, I just Googled it. <laughs> in the United States, it's 7.6 paid holidays. Um, on average. On average, yeah. Uh, and that's uh, in line with where I work. And I mean, I think when you real, as a, as a manager, when you're faced, you know, and I think a lot of you guys would agree with this, as a manager, when you're faced to, with um, running an organization, and you have a limited number of work hours, and then you start limiting that even further because of employees off it just becomes harder and harder and um, n none of the expected work is going to be less. Right. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, so, I think this is something that yeah. so we can dig deep on. What we'll take up back then with consent of the council is um, you know we'll, we'll look at it as a consideration but we want to wait to get to that mid-year mark and see what the revenues are um, and maybe that would be um, something that'd be better for them anyway. Mm -hmm. So okay, all right, all right. Thanks for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, I'm for plastic bag fee. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's a person there. Yes. Mayor and council members. Um, regarding this, and you'll recall the conversation that we had previously. The big question with respect to this is whether we ask the, uh, the businesses, primarily Safeway, if they are willing to remit the 10 cent money they're making per plastic bag to the city. Um, so first of all, Walmart is not selling plastic bags. That is just not happening. So you have an excuse to buy their bags or you put everything in your cart and you wheel it to your car, or I am told in many instances you shoplift the entire <laughs> cart. I, I guess that's a very common thing. So that would be um, option number three. Has Safeway three. put bags out? Because they haven't. I mean, they Has Safeway? They, I'm sorry, was your question Safeway? Yeah. Yeah, they have. They don't make them really like readily visible, oh, right. but yeah, if you ask for them, they give you plastic oh, bags, yeah, yeah. 10 yeah. cents a bag. Yeah, yeah. 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 And if you'll, if you'll yeah. recall, when we talked about this in a, in a prior, um, I, I believe it was in a, in a regular meeting I brought this up, but this CML outline that is part of your materials, in this middle column towards the bottom, they were talking about how the remittance of the 10 cents to the municipality it was a typo. It said you don't have to remit until April of 2024. Well, because this is happening now, it was supposed to be April. Well, it was supposed to be in 2023. So they were supposed to be holding on to that money um, for us. And then I, I guess we would just get a big check in, in 2024. So the question is, do we want to ask for the money now? for our portion of the, the 10 cent fee. And I would welcome um, Audra, we have the, the CML thing is there, but I would like Audra to comment on anything that I may have missed or of course gotten wrong. And Mayor Council, as Audra is getting ready, just wanted to, the letter I handed out um, is a terrific example right. from Durango of how they notified their um, businesses of this rule, so we will once we're, once we're ready, we will do something very similar to make sure everybody gets the message from us. Isn't it, isn't it likely that Safeway already has a corporate response to this? They likely do. We we haven't heard from them. Um, and then the way the rule's written, it says that we can collaborate with local retailers before April 1st, 2024 to begin receiving those payments, but there's no mandate that we do that. Right. And if we can get something I agree. So I think it's much longer. Yeah, I think that we should ask them. You know what's really interesting about this whole thing is that there's exemptions to the to the bill of uh, anybody who has an establishment that's less than two, uh, or more than or less than three incumbents. Yeah. 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 So also, pretty much all small entities are. Pretty much exempt yeah. from this right. bill. Right. Well, it's only really starting with all the large. Which arguably is a good thing. I mean, if you want to kind of like have small businesses be 
you're not subject to that. Probably not good for the environmental considerations of not having plastic bags in the environment. Anyway, I'm just I'm thinking out loud. Right? I saw that. That was interesting. But the same way it changes their policy to white Walmart. They ain't any plastic bags. Right, I understand. I um, I think Safeway is going to be doing this for 2023. And they kind of said, okay, we'll do this, but we're going to sell the bags for, for a dime. And, you know, I, I don't know if it's a big money maker for them, but they're going to be Kroger pretty quick. Right. And Kroger we'll will do it. What did you say over there? There is so much misinformation about this because there are small mom and pop stores mm -hmm. that are not using plastic now, which is a good thing, but they don't understand that they're exempt from this. But the other part, part of that, too, is that the uh, the, the dining establishments coming up, they're not going to be able to use coal. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so this bill, the way it was concocted, is kind of it threw things all over the place. Right. And right. I think that's where, like you're saying, the confusion. It is. is do I do this? Sure. Or do I not do this? And I think that is a, that's that's causing right. a lot of confusion. Right. But for our you know conversation this afternoon, would you like us to make a request of and it isn't just Safeway, they're not going to So ask them to begin uh, remitting to us the money that they're collecting. I think that's a good idea. You're yeah. already nodding like this. I know, I know. That's <laughs> right. It's a work session, no decision has been made. Audrey, is there anything you want to add? Please add something. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can add it though. I have a call that I need to return to someone that um, has asked about the taxability of the value. And so that's um, I had that conversation as a tangible product. So it would also be subject to sales tax. But aside from that, um, I think it's a good idea if we, if we go ahead and start collecting early as opposed to having them hold on to money and having to turn it over later. It'll help those businesses out a little bit. Because sure, then we have to start building and keeping track of our starting numbers and all. Right. And if there is, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, if there is a taxability, like if there is a sales tax, exactly how that's going to be assessed it would likely cut into whatever we would be collecting. So, probably better to try and get it now, you know, for a variety of reasons. What were you going to say? Well, now? it's really. It's really fortunate that we're talking about plastic bags and land at the same yeah, time. Yeah, right. Because I remember Bob, Bob, I had mentioned it one time in a meeting that the landfill is beautiful when you go out there, except for those stupid plastic right. bags are right. a nuisance. They're awful, yeah. And I, you know, I hope you can rectify it with this, this new requirement. Right. Okay. May, may I be excused? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You have item five liquor license fees. Is that Audra or who's going to Ruger? Who's this Garrett? That one would be me, Mr. Mayor. All right. Go ahead. So, um, Mayor, I'm going to ask you to make a does the city have to increase its fee schedule with respect to liquor licenses since 2007? Um, there's a few areas where city council has discretion as to how much you would want to increase the fees, and then there's areas where you don't have discretion. So, for instance, application fees for um, new licenses currently are at $625 for the local fee. And then in addition to that, a license fee for a license for a hotel restaurant would pay the license fee of $75 for a total of $700. Um, council has the discretion of increasing the application fee up to $1,000. 
transfer of ownership applications, again, are currently at $625 and can be increased up to $750. Same with changeable facings at 625 they can be increased up to $750. Um, probably the one that's a little bit more, I just had a little bit more discussion and thought is special event permit fees. They're currently at $25 per day for the malt business and spirituous liquor licenses and 10 per day for fermented malt beverage. Um, those are up to, again, in your discussion, up to $100 per day. Um, and then finally, fees that do not do not allow local discretion, the, the actual renewal fee for a license is being increased from $75 to $100. Um, also within the ordinance that's been drafted for your consideration at the next meeting are um, some various license types and other fees that are assessed. And um, I have a typo in it. I just know. Um, but those are identified by state statute. I just would like to include them in the local ordinance. That way, should someone look at our ordinance or the fees there, they can find those fees in our ordinance as well. So, um, I guess comparatively, currently the city, well, currently in all along, the city has charged marijuana licensees a $1,000 fee for both the um, investigation and license fee so that is the total fee that's charged annually for marijuana and also at initial application um, so there's some food for that for you um, what i will say with respect to special event permits is they tend to be labor intensive and i thought for a very long time that the 25 dollar fee per day is low um, it requires um, a posting, it requires the, a number of inspections, it requires both our fire chief and our police chief to review their safety and security plans. Um, many times we sit down as a group with, with these applicants and go over their entire plan depending on, I guess, the potential impact, potential safety concerns. And so the $25 per day is, I've always thought it's been too low. Um, but I don't know that you want to go all the way up to the $100 maximum. Um, this is a reminder. Applicants are allowed 15 days, calendar dates per year. So it could represent $1,500 in total for an applicant. With that, I'll answer any questions that I can. Uh, Audra, uh, when was the last time that this was updated? 2007. Okay. A long time. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of gives us an idea as to what maybe we should be. Mm -hmm. Right. Thoughts? Do you have any thoughts? No, 25 is pretty low, but 100 is pretty high for especially men. But um, <coughs> other than that, I don't know. Do we have enough liquor stores in Trinidad? Well, <laughs> I mean, absolutely not. <laughs> 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 yeah, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> <laughs> I would throw in on special events that's generally um, things that bring people to town and benefit our bottom lines and the tourism point of view. So I don't want to put so much of a burden on organizations that are putting together special events. I would support it going up to 50, um, because 25 seems extraordinarily low in this day and age, but 100 also, if you think about a two-day event, whatever, it's, 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 you know, it can become a hiccup in, in getting those things done. I was waiting for my laugh to die down, and then I was going to get serious. <laughs> <laughs> we need to afford you that opportunity. I live for the laugh, guys. I live for the laugh. No, you know, seriously, though, when you look at our packets, even like what Audra said about special events, the man, uh, the number of man hours it takes, 
I mean, everybody has to sign off. Everybody has to go and spend. So, you know, I've, I've been on the special event side where we did have to pay that money for a, a nonprofit, but really for the amount of profit on alcohol, mm -hmm. that's where you make your money. And I say, I, I, I say for sure, go to the, the max, the $100. Other thoughts? Hundred dollars is kind of steep, but um, I guess you have to account for uh, growth in our town being having more bigger and better events. So, so um, seven five is, is a good number for sure. I have a fifty seventy five and a half. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, yeah. Were you going no, I was just waiting for everybody. I mean, to, you know, on the special events. Can yeah, I know? think we should. Well, no, I think we should we should raise it, but I think we should all come to a, a, an amount that we're all agreeable with, too. Uh, like I say, upping it up to 50% is a lot, but uh, could go 75, too. So I'm kind of in between both. You know, if you take a look at the, the difference, there's. there's uh, if we go, there's 75 bucks difference between 25 and 100 bucks. So if you split that in half, you're looking at the difference. So if you had, you know, take that difference, uh, let's say an additional, go up to, let's say, you know, 60, 60, 65 bucks. I think that sounds, 75 starts reaching that threshold. I'm not sure what you guys think. Yeah. Um, Stop and figure out how many man hours. hours that, that's, how many man hours does it take to... Depends on the event, but it's, okay. it's considerable in certain okay. circumstances. Well, from from what I heard, I mean, you're sitting down with city staff to include the police chief, the fire chief, and right. several department heads. <laughs> if you have that meeting for a half hour, yeah, you're you're hitting that hundred dollars right. right there. Yes. And th this is this is my thought. <clears throat> um, this uh, special event permit, that's things like what what examples is the special event permit? Just so we're all speaking the same. Like, uh, what? So, for, um, I'll use an example because we have um, we have the AR missile that applied for all 15 at one time at the beginning of last year. And if you remember, you just recently had to allow a change in one of the dates. Um, but there is ranges in um, from various things that they host. So yeah. I think they do the um, Noah's Art yeah. fundraising event. They do um, Evergreen. Not Evergreen. Right. Anymore. Yeah. No, they, they, they do the Evergreen. <laughs> um, so, just, just to use that as an example, then, Audra, I mean, you know, like you said, they're, they're meeting with those the staff members. I don't think that $100 is so onerous that they're not going to do it. The, the profits covered are, are going to exceed that. I don't think it's going to, um, in most cases, they're going to be passed on to the end user anyway, I would imagine, in some capacity or another. That being said, I think it's important for us to protect the um, city, i.e. the taxpayer, from subsidizing the application of a liquor license. That's my opinion. Well, you know what, back when I attended a a couple of years ago, you know, you go to and get a drink, you know, and you used to pay, you know, four or five bucks for a drink. You know, I like to drink scotch. So a little bit of scotch that they give you, and it was costing, like I said, four or five bucks. And I went to this event the other day, and it was, I think it was like 12 bucks for the drink. So the profit margin you know, was not watered down. It's huge. It's huge. <laughs> so, you know, you, you guys are right in that, in that regard. And I think more than one day before they raise the prices up to six bucks a drink. Yes. A beer has gone from the two fifty up to seventy eight bucks. Yeah, that's what we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, also Can we do something with uh, raising it up to seventy five and then maybe next year sure. or recently to a hundred? That way, we don't jump all at one time on it. Yeah, good thought. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. But, you know, yeah, raise it to 75 and then next year, uh, look, at the, look at it 100. That way, you know, we're trying to work with the people that do the, the events. Let's discuss raising it to 500 right now, and we'll just stop at 100. <laughs> 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 I 
Yeah, I think that I think that would be better for the public. I don't know why not. You know, we're raising everything, even though no matter what. So we got to somewhere kind of cut a little slacks in it. And like you said, we want to bring people here. We don't want to chase anybody away. So if we increase it that way, and then next year add the twenty-five to it, then that way we're pretty well covered. Well, I, I just saw last night in the news that uh, they were talking about the beer establishments and the beer producers. The beer, uh, they're all having to, uh, their costs have gone quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's, you go to a liquor store now, you know, you used to buy a bottle of wine for five bucks. You can't get one for 16 bucks now. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah, so five 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 this is rapidly devolving. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I really think that you know, the bank has a really good thought. So, uh, I think the last thing I'll say about the special events permit is, is council will recall a while back by now. Um, we opted to not have state approval. So the state is no longer collecting their fees from the special events. So um, for the last couple of years since we've done that, they've actually, the permit holders have actually seen a savings of it, the equivalent of our local fee. So if it was a malt business spiritualist um, that was $25 per day, they were saving that money by not having to also pay that to the state. So I think, I think 75 is reasonable. Um, certainly our cost is, I'm sure, the $100. But where you get to catch 22 is, for instance, back to the AR Mitchell Museum, where they come in and make an application for all 15 days. Um, generally speaking, those are one day events, maybe two day events. They're not anything that um, necessarily takes as much that time we do one posting instead of 15 postings. So it's kind of difficult. That's why I think the 75 is probably a safer number for that, for that reason. What about a bulk discount? Right. So, right? A bulk, well, and you could do something like that. So long as we don't exceed the $100 per day, you could say, um, you know, seventy-five or fifty dollars per day, up to a certain number, a maximum number, if they're applying all at one time. But when they're when they're applying separately, it does it's labor intensive. It really is. The Audra didn't, and I was looking here, but I can't find it now. Isn't there something there about duplicate license fees? Yeah. Now, let's say you have an entity that has five different establishments that they sell out of each establishment. If they come and apply for a license and they have, you know, five establishments, does that one fee apply to all five of them or is it individual if they got to pay for it? It's individual. Okay. Right, but it's for a new license, I think, in that instance. Okay. Yeah. Right, Audra? What's that? The duplicate license, I think, is just that if someone lost, you know, if they lost their hard copy of their license, they just pay a fee to the state to replace it at $50. Hey, Audrey, quick question for you. Do you know how many special events uh, and permits we issue every year, roughly? Um, Sorry to put you on the spot. Number of days or number of applicants? Ooh, that's a good question. Well, let's say number of applicants. I would say number of applicants probably only about six since COVID. Okay. Um, prior to COVID, we had more. Um, number of days, I would say probably about 30. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Andra, could you explain if we've ever had these two items, items seven and eight, in here um, about the reissue fee and the reissue fine? Have we, have we ever run into those situations? Uh, no, we haven't. Okay. We've run into late fees, but never reissue fee or reissue fine. Okay. Well, then it sounds like, you know, like I said, that special events, you know, something like that $75 range is something to, at least a starting point. I think it's sort of like that's a consensus, a general consensus. 
And yeah. what about for new licenses, Mayor? Any increase? Uh, I think the new licenses, I, I think it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think it's appropriate, right? I think, yeah. Okay. I think so. Let's see. Let's see what else. Yeah, I think, I think they're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else that, uh, so that pretty much wind up our work session portion? Uh, any items that council wants to bring forward in other uh, work sessions? Well, the only other thing would, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, were you going to say something? No. Uh, maybe, uh, Bob, just you could give us some updates on this new year projects that we're going to work on and start getting on doing it because you know we'd like to get started in the springtime instead of the winter time to get projects going but i think that would be a good idea to update us on a lot of that and i'll 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 probably put on that a bit what okay. my thoughts are uh, anything from you guys a uh, couple of things one of the things is we're talking about a retreat and we're talking about a retreat of uh, uh time frame uh, i think it was around the February 24th. 4th, I believe. 24th, yeah. Every Tuesday through Friday. And that is the thing that I think that we'll be able to get all of our uh, directors there and they can give us an update of their strategic plan, like exactly what you're talking about. So I think that that's, that would be a good time to, to do that. Uh, and the other thing, too, is uh, right every year I've done a state of the city address, and I'm probably talking about the 9th, which is a, I think a Thursday, I'm not sure, Thursday or Friday. I'm going to think about that time frame for the state of the city address. Just you guys know. Mayor, would the retreat be all day or half a day? Well, I think with the, with the agenda we have, it's pretty much a full day, Bill. Yeah. Councilman nice. Williamson was saying two days. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's why I was laughing. Sorry. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that I think that we have to, to discuss. Okay. So, so full day. So fix yeah. your court calendar. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> I know. Yes. Any other thoughts? Okay. 